I would like to um, first give the floor to our audience to ask questions before we go on the online questions. So um, may I please invite um, three from the audience to ask your questions if you may uh, come to the podium to the middle. Thanks. Hello. Yeah. Thank you very much for a very interesting presentation. I'm looking forward to see the whole report, hopefully uh, more to be learned. But um, when you said about drivers of favorability, I was uh, partly getting the answer to my earlier question, but still uh, the social, economic and network uh, channels of influence, were they decided on some empirical basis as the decisive tools of uh, gaining favorability by China. For example, I'm just thinking, for example, of media and other ways of uh, maybe uh, ideational influence that are not captured by network, for example. And especially since you just you said these are just examples, some examples for networks. Uh, uh, Twitter is something such a tiny thing in Kyrgyzstan. I'm just wondering whether there are other things that you also could measure. Thank you, Emil. We'll take two more questions for the first round. Perhaps our speakers have a question for Samantha as well. Uh, please go to the podium, Anton. Would you? Um, no, ask me any comments. Uh, for do you have a question for Samantha? Um, comments. Comments. Um, I think it's better if you speak to the mic so she can hear you. Yeah. yeah thanks. Uh, okay, Samantha, can you hear me? <laughs> Um, so I just, I read it, your full report and I found it very interesting and actually very wonderful. Uh, thank you, you saving my time because usually I'm collecting such of this information by myself. It's the first thing. And second thing is also um, very interesting to uh, look uh, some perspectives from the other states. Uh, I'm usually concentrated on only on Kazakhstan. So um, this is my first comment. It's actually very interesting to, to, to look on the, uh, something what 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 uh, uh, happened in the other states uh, with Chinese influence. Uh, so um, I have a few comments and um, uh, may I, maybe I'll start from the strategies. Um, as I saw, you have uh, extract, nudge and avoid strategies, right? Um, for my opinion, I think it will be better to call it not uh, strategies, but like a policies. Because um, uh, I think uh, China now don't have any strategies here as uh, uh, own uh, strategies or own view on the region. And this is a big problem. And actually, I saw uh, many information you collected actually helps me to answer, uh, help me to show this. Um, yes, this is, a pro this is a, uh, China's problem here because um, for example, uh, okay, I start from the foreign ministry. Uh, in foreign ministry, you don't see the Central Asia Department. There is another, it's uh, East Europe, Russia and Central Asia Department. So there's only one small office is looking on Central Asia perspectives. From this side, we can see it's not any official strategies uh, according to the region. It's just the one thing. Uh, some others is, um, uh, 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 yes, about uh, um, uh, yes, uh, uh, some other things is, um, for example, the usually strategy, uh, the usually China acts in Central Asia, uh, like um, uh, it's Chinese companies or Chinese uh, own ministries, or maybe uh, like foreign ministry separately. Uh, connection with uh, some like in diplomacy ties uh, in or um, some uh, 
uh, kind of uh, uh, some kind of uh, companies also have own interest. And uh, so from these things, we find this, um, for example, education diplomacy working quite well. And uh, we saw this in the report, but uh, in the economic ties, in the economic uh, things, uh, uh, economic deals what China are doing in Central Asia sometimes destroying this education progress. Uh, so it's why I think it's uh, maybe uh, this ex extractive, yes, extractive, niche and avoid strategies better called like policy and uh, maybe change a bit, a little bit. So this is first thing. The, uh, the next thing is I really want to ask you about FDA actually. Um, I, I, before I got your new report, I read it, uh, your, the previous one and I found this very interesting and actually this is a very big question to collect uh, all the information about the, how much of Chinese investments in uh, Central Asian states and especially in Kazakhstan. Um, uh, it's, uh, and so I really want to ask you and how you collect it from uh, what source and for, um, for example on a, uh, in the Central, uh, Central Asia uh, in Kazakhstan um, uh, have some problems with collection of the information because some of the projects uh, actually uh, in statistics not included as uh, foreign investment but included as domestic investments. So uh, it's also a big question and uh, I want to hear more, a bit more about it. Uh, so the number four Pools, yes, pools. Uh, Gallup is very good, and um, I uh, asked my uh, colleagues, so sociologists in Kazakhstan, and they found this uh, Gallup in Kazakhstan works very well. Uh, but um, I, in Kazakhstan, we have some specifics. Um, this our public very atom, uh, automatic. We have a very separate, different, uh, different uh, public, uh, different small groups of public. So uh, the better to use uh, not only one pool, but to choose some, 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 something else. I can uh, recommend this. Niva have uh, one uh, had one pool from Central uh, Central Asia monitor, right? Uh, so uh, it will be great to. Uh, compete this to see uh, to see uh, like something in the middle between these pools, uh, and uh, for example, I found the, in the in the pool uh, it's around uh, 20 or 40 percent supporting on China. Uh, as I know from my pools, uh, uh, it's not published; it was closed uh, two years ago. Uh, it's actually uh, much less than uh, than 40 percent supporting on China. So it's, it will be very interesting uh, things to to see some other pools, uh, and also in, in the pools here we find uh, a con um, like uh, concentration uh, in the pools. The better if we choose not only United States, India, and uh, who else? Uh, China, yes, but also uh, some other states because uh, if you put uh, plus some other states, it will be the results will be very, uh, very, very different. For example, Turkey. Uh, now Turkey is growing up, and we see uh, the supporters of Turkey. Um, uh, China supports le less, but Turkey supports more. So here we can find some very interesting uh, things from this. Uh, so uh, yeah, about Twitter. Some uh, previous uh, speakers already told about the Twitter. It will be uh, better to use something like Facebook or VK, of course, Vkontakte. But um, I also want to say it's also a kind of media bubble. Uh, so here I want to. Make Mentioned, you said about the Kazakhstan problem uh, uh, after, uh, before actually, before uh, President Takayev visited uh, China, there was some protests. So actually, it was very shown on the media, but the people who joined this protest is very less. So it's just, uh, it's, uh, it can say this is a kind of negative public opinion on this. It's kind of media uh, campaign. 
that was a media campaign. So uh, it's about the media bubbles. Uh, so Facebook, you, uh, you, the better if you check it, but you have to be careful about the, uh, the information sphere there. So, and the last one is about education. It's also very good uh, that you um, collected this uh, government scholarships. But I think it will be better to add some, because we have a lot of um, some other scholarships, not only government, but some domestic governments and some private companies. For example, CNPC. I think CNPC uh, scholarship in Kazakhstan now may be even more than government scholarship. So, about the covering of the state, uh, you mentioned this 2% of the students covering by government. But if we want to show this, uh, how, Ch how China covering the education in, uh, in Central Asia, it will be better to also see some uh, private companies, domestic, uh, some, uh, dom uh, some domestic governments. But, um, uh, it's also, uh, 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 it's also, I understand, it's also very hard to find such of this information. This is uh, actually very hard to find the resources uh, with uh, collecting of the all, for example, number of students. Uh, so it's, I understand it's very hard. So uh, because of this, I very uh, like your report because you, uh, I think this is the first report in recent uh, two, maybe three years years, uh, showing us uh, something um, some, somewhat uh, between the five Central Asian states, the differences, and uh, like trying to show us China's own, uh, China's own uh, strategy or policy in the region. So thank you very much. Thank you, Anton. Um, and Samantha, as you can see, we are actively engaging with your report. We also have a question from Roman. Um, please, Roman. Uh, <clears throat> thank you so much, Samantha, for your excellent uh, presentation. I'm looking forward to reading the report. Uh, and I'm sure that you've done a great job in terms of uh, collecting this data. And I'm, I, I imagine it probably took so much time and effort. So I think, yeah, well done. I have two questions, and I'll try to be... Uh, short the first question is uh, maybe slightly provocative but um uh, the way you presented the report and the way you focus on the chinese approach to building corridors of power may look like beijing and the central government um, is very coordinated in terms of its effort to promote its influence right i mean this i, I get this impression um in my research and what we've been doing in terms of studying, for example, BRI projects, we learned that actually, and we talked also to Chinese experts from Beijing. So what they said is that Beijing has no central uh, database with all the BRI projects, which means that there's very limited coordination between the central governments, regional authorities promoting their own projects abroad, also uh, private Chinese companies that do not coordinate their, for example, uh, plans abroad to, to do some investment or like to open, uh, you know, some new uh, schools or anything else. So what I'm saying is that there's very, uh, I mean, it's a, quite a big problem for Beijing that it cannot control and coordinate uh, all its, basically, all its actors. So my question to you is then, how, how would you comment on that? And do you see that some of the corridors of power are more coordinated or maybe some of them are less? And uh, how do you see it? And the second one, maybe more general, uh, of course, I'm not sure of, uh, if you did similar research on other big countries, uh, for example, in Russia, or maybe also the US, but I'm just wondering, um, what do you think, how <clears throat> unique is Chinese approach to build its corridors of power? Do you find it really sp specifically unique compared to many other countries like former big powers or the present uh, other big powers? And then, if, if so, what do you think makes it unique? Thank you. Excellent question. Neva, did you want me to go ahead and respond to those three? Uh, do you need me to do a summary of all three questions, or are you okay? I think I'm okay, but if I miss anything, feel free to let, let me know. There's a lot of good, um, good ideas there. Um, so let me go back to, I think, the first question. I forget the gentleman's name, my apologies. Um, 
And this was a little bit to what was included in, or what was our methodology for determining what to include or not to include. Um, and this was partly with regard to the uh, discussion of social media, but then perhaps more broadly as well. Um, so when we started this project, and I alluded to at the start that we've been working on trying to quantify China's public diplomacy influence over four projects now, over 40 different countries. When we first started out, and maybe you will recognize this too, to quantify something, you have to have a clear definition for what is included, what are the bounds and the parameters. We found that there was not a lot of a common consensus on what was included in public diplomacy or not. And so that was one of the first hurdles we had to overcome was to try to say, okay, how do we define this? How do we think about what are the types of categories of public diplomacy activities in an ideal world? And what are some examples of activities underneath those things? And then when it came to trying to look at uh, quantifying this, um, we had to identify a set of proxy measures that we thought we could credibly actually collect data on over time and space. Um, not all of the things that we would like to collect, we were able to collect. And so, you know, in, in some areas, we have to primarily talk in terms of qualitative uh, dynamics. Um, but in terms of quantitatively, what we you know, have looked at in terms of public diplomacy are five different categories of, of tools. So looking at exchange diplomacy. So example of this would be sister cities and study abroad. Um, we've looked at cultural diplomacy. Uh, so for example, the Confucius Institutes or cultural centers. Uh, we've looked at elite diplomacy. So the amount of visits going back and forth between countries and their leaders. Uh, we looked at financing, of course, as you know, one in a, a very important part of many foreign powers uh, activities, although it tends to be more aid rather than debt. Um, and then informational diplomacy, we kind of viewed as originally more focused on traditional media, international broadcasting. So in the US context, think like Voice of America, or in China's context, think about China Daily. Um, but then with this report, um, trying to build upon those, those categories. So we recognize that uh, previously we had only focused on really on the Confucius Institutes and hadn't thought about these other forms of educational cooperation, like the scholarships and the, the visa restrictions and the like. So we said, okay, well, how do we actually really understand um, additional ways that China is making it easier for, for students to study abroad? Um, I think with the, the social media, it was a recognition that well, some would argue that traditional media is dead. I don't think that's true, but you know, certainly foreign powers are experimenting with not only your, your mainline international broadcasting channels, but also with new media, particularly Facebook and, and Twitter, but also the contact that was mentioned and, and many more. Um, and so we were, we were curious to, to try to capture that. And uh, we settled on Twitter primarily because it was the most achievable to be able to, to quantify, um, given the, our ability to access, they have a nice API, you can be able to do this. But I also think that it's reasonable to give you a glimpse into state orchestrated storytelling because Twitter is uh, you know, banned in China, it's very curbed in terms of its use. The, those that are using the platform are, are you know, most frequently PRC di diplomats, consulates, um, state-run media houses that are doing it with the tacit um, support of the, of the state. There's been interesting um, comparisons done between Facebook content and Twitter content that indicate that the way in which Beijing seems to be using those two platforms is different. So what um, studies have shown is that, you know, when it comes to Facebook, it's a lot more of promotion of official content. Whereas with Twitter, there's an experimentation with more of a personalized style of, of um, engaging with other contacts. So it's an interesting case study in that respect. And then also, you know, part of our argument with looking at the Twitter social media platform was a, was a chance to look at an explicitly elite form of communication, if you will, as compared to the broad-based 
uh, traditional media. Um, that you know, if you're thinking about trying to capture the ear of leaders or policy elites in a country, these are the, the groups of people that are most likely to be using Twitter. Uh, so even though it may not be representative of the broader population, you know, tends to be more educated, younger, urban, um, and the like, that, that is useful in and of itself. I also thought it was useful because it's been so politically charged of a topic to see uh, China engaging in Twitter and it becomes uh, quite a firestorm. Um, but yes, you're certainly right. I think that um, there is much more that we could capture and do. And I think we continue to like to, to drill down on that uh, further. Anton raised a number of great comments. Um, you know, I your your question and this this Roman picked up on this, I think, a little bit. Um, Anton, your your comment was, well, extract, avoid, and nudge should be policies, not strategies. And I think Roman, you asked the question of, well. Is, is China really coordinated or not? And it's funny because uh, anytime I write anything on this topic, there's always this big question that rolls around of, well, how strategic is China versus opportunistic? <laughs> and, and I think that uh, both points are fair and I don't think that it's one or the other. Um, I agree with your insight, Ruben, that um, if you look like, if you look at the aid space, for example, uh, that you referred to with, with BRI, uh, heavily fragmented, multiple, multiple organizations, agencies across the central level, never mind looking at subnationally <laughs> what's going on. And, and there's a lot of different voices and actors. What's interesting about BRI is that um, I've read some studies that domestic scholars within China have done about BRI, and they say that um, the, the fuzziness of BRI is purposeful uh, in that uh, Xi Jinping was very intentional about wanting to have something that was broad enough and flexible enough that uh, various you know, agencies, levels of the bureaucracy could shoehorn in their <laughs> projects, but within the blessing of the broader BRI construct. I thought, well, that's very creative. Um, and, you know, and I think that the same might be true of uh, you know, the financial diplomacy I described earlier or many of these tools. Um, I think that you know, we looked at this, so we looked at uh, things that the Chinese government had talked about in terms of aspirations and goals and their strategies and plans. But then we also um, tried to follow their investments you know, uh, I've heard it say, say that, you know, rhetoric is one thing, but budgets are really the best measure of, of an actor's real priorities, right? Or their revealed priorities, whether they say they're the priorities or not. And that was kind of the lens we took when we're looking at trying to understand these three public diplomacy strategies or policies, if you will, was trying to understand when you look at the data, you take a step back, you, you know, engage in some hierarchical clustering, what actually is floating to the top in terms of how, what's the revealed hand of what China is doing there? Um, I think that, uh, so that's a fair point, Anton. I'm happy to change it to policies. Um, I think your point you alluded to what, uh, is also true that, you know, I have been very impressed with the synchronicity of the tools, but they can also undercut each other. And I think you alluded to this in passing that, you know, sometimes you can have, for example, a BRI project or even a Confucius Institute that is politically charged or, or um, you know, has negative connotations in within the population and that undercuts, you know, something else positive that that was also there. So that's, you know, that is a, a, a challenge for sure. I think I mentioned uh, the response to Twitter. I would love to get my hands on Facebook data and be contact. So uh, as our next hill that we're going to surge to, definitely look me up. I'd love to collaborate on that because it's it's hard uh, getting this data. <laughs> so we're, we're kind of fighting for every inch we get, but I, I would love to look at that. Um, your point also on the education on the scholarship side. So that's absolutely true. I mean, one of the reasons why we start with the state and with the government is 
is because that's the cleanest form of public diplomacy, right? That is state directed. Um, but when you think about the fact that China is able to marshal almost a whole of society approach of you know, bringing on board uh, the higher education institutions to also fund scholarships, uh, enticing uh, private sector companies from China to get involved. I've seen many examples in across the region of, um, Kind of clinics or hubs with technical training or vocational training that it's a win-win you know there's there's scholarships tied into future study abroad but there's also the chance to train kind of a captive market or audience in your in your systems in your tools and your standards right now um, and so i think that is true there's there's a bunch of um, important actors there that we're not capturing and then roman to uh your your question on how unique is is China's approach here? I I think it, it's mixed. I think there is a lot of uh, borrowing of the playbook of of other foreign powers. You know, China was not the first foreign power to recognize the value of educating the leaders of other countries. <laughs> I think uh, you know the U.S. and the U.K. and 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 others for a long time have recognized that. So that is that is you know part and parcel uh, been around for a while. You know I also mentioned at the start that many foreign powers um, have long had aid programs uh, to be able to not only be responsive to to needs on the ground but also to bolster their reputation and to be seen as a a, a reliable responsible partner that's not new uh, at all um, and so there's many of these tools that are you know have been around in some form or another i think when i think about what is unique about china's approach to using these tools it's a few um, one is that even though I agree with what Roman said about there's more fragmentation than we might have first see with China, um, when compared to other foreign powers, most often people will say, well, you know, if you have a US or you have a UK, you know, a, a democracy where the government can't tell the private sector or civil society what to do. The benefits of that is you have many, many voices that are seen as trustworthy because they're not all <laughs> directed by the state. But at the same time, not all of these voices are singing the, to the same tune to the same set of music. <laughs> and so that can be frustrating because it seems like instead of one narrative, you have many, many different narratives. Um, that is not necessarily the case with China as much as there is some um, fragmentation in the bureaucracy about what gets focused on or who does what, I think there definitely is a lot more coordination in terms of the narrative. And the reason I say that is because like, there have been pronouncements that have come down from the central government to state-run media outlets or even state-affiliated media outlets saying, here are the terms you're allowed to use, here are the terms you're not allowed to use. Um, you know, And I think that, I think that it's not you know, too much of a jump to assume that um, there probably is more centralization in, in those messages. I think another is the scale. Um, the level of money that China is able to, to marshal for this, I mean, they have over a $3 trillion reserve um, and they are willing and focused and demonstrated that they are willing to use that to bankroll public diplomacy programs around the world. Um, that is something which is quite unique compared to other foreign powers that maybe used to have larger public diplomacy budgets but are getting slashed down uh, due to other priorities or concerns or never had a large budget to begin with. Um, you even compare Russia versus China. Russia isn't getting into the same game as China with regard to financial diplomacy or even the doubling down on these language and cultural institutes. They're relying a lot more heavily on inertia. So, you know, I think that that's, a, you know, a clear difference there. So I would say, yeah, scale, uh, centralization. Um, and, you know, I think that the fact that you can like purposefully uh, you know, for some synergy across these different tools is, is quite unique. Somebody else up there.
Thank you, Samantha. I don't want to keep you up too late, but I do want to have one last round of questions. Um, before we go on the online questions, I would just want to remind the audience that you can ask a question in Russian. We have a translator that can translate the question. So I would just um, let our audience decide in the next couple of minutes why I read the questions online. We have um, a reporter from South China Morning Post, Linda. Um, good to see you. Linda asked a question for Samantha. Um, and here it goes. This December marks the 30th anniversary of the collapse of the Soviet Union. Now that China is expanding its influence in the Central Asian region, how do you think the legacy of the Soviet Union has influenced China's diplomacy in this region? Or do you think that China has its own strategies and motivations for its presence in Central Asia? Uh, thanks, Linda. This is um, first question. And then we also have Philip Reed. Also, thanks, Philip, for coming. Philip is uh, a research fellow at the University of Oxford. He was also our associate research fellow a couple of years ago here at the OSC Academy. Good to see you, Philip. Uh, Philip has a two-part question. Uh, Philip asks, how successful do you think China has been compared with previous attempts by the European Union, the United States, and Japan in leveraging the no zero concept? Do you think that the Chinese Ministry of Foreign Affairs still recognize the importance of Central Asia in legitimizing its Silk Road diplomacy? So these are our two online questions. I will just ask again our audience if you would like to ask your question in Russian. If you would like to ask your question, please come to the podium. Yeah. Hi, Samantha, thank you very much. Um, I think now you know about BRI more than decision makers in Beijing now. So <laughs> thank you for that. And thank you for, for, for the report, it's great. I've been following what um, a data uh, doing for a couple of years now. And, um, I'm a fan. I, I have a very short question about the future. What, what um, I think obviously the, this project is going to be, uh, you know, prolonged, and we will see some other publications in the future. And uh, is there any plans already on what you want to uh, focus on? Maybe uh, considering the pandemic, something like healthcare, you know, uh, health, silk road, and stuff like that. Thank you. Go ahead, Samantha, thank you. Okay, great. Uh, thank you so much for the questions. Uh, on the last point, um, wonderful to hear that you've been following our work. Uh, in terms of what's next, um, so you mentioned the pandemic, and I think that is interesting. You know, there are many scholars that are starting to point to COVID-19 as kind of a critical juncture in um, looking at the future of uh, foreign power influence in the region. And I think it's, it's a good case study for public diplomacy. I have often said, so I didn't know how, so we asked that question about um, which foreign power adapted their public diplomacy best in the context of COVID-19. And we added that uh, with the pandemic. And I had my suspicions of how it would be answered and it came out in the way that I thought it would, <laughs> which was um, I had you know, long assumed that China seemed to have leveraged the synchronicity of the tools to much greater effect um than than its competitors had you know and you think about that it's particularly notable because it started in a pretty negative space where you know was, uh, having to backpedal and address a lot of criticism uh about its early handling of the pandemic and then you know to shift from that to uh, in downtown this is outside of the region but it's a classic case of you know downtown belgrade 
the, the Serbian government paying for a billboard that says, thank you, Brother Xi, for all of the, the medical teams and the, the vaccination donations and all that. It's a pretty substantial change. And it's an interesting example of, you know, it's the combination of China investing a lot in um, sending donations of PPE, of the, the equipment, the vaccines overseas, pairing that with financing uh, on reasonable terms to help uh, countries build their own capacity to produce vaccines and health preparedness in future. And then you have the, the narrative diplomacy, the, the use of social media and traditional media to portray both a positive message of, of China as being, you know, a vaccine ambassador, you know, engaging in this mass diplomacy, but then also a counter critical narrative of foreign powers and saying, well, what is the US doing? What is, you know, the UK doing? What is India doing? Um, and I think that's been quite effective. And, and I think what I'm curious to see is, is this the new normal or, or does it taper off? or does it actually pick up from here? And I think this would be a really interesting juncture to, to do a study specifically focused on um, an idea that China has been kicking around for a while called the Health Silk Road. They, they floated it, I think it was out of the, the Ministry of Health floated it a few years ago, it was kind of poo-pooed -poo and kind of pushed to the side. All of a sudden it's seeing its light of day again, right? Because it's opportunistically useful. So, you know, I think that would be one to, to focus on. Um, I would love to push further on the, the social media meets or the digital diplomacy meets traditional public diplomacy um, in future. We scratched the surface. We didn't get as far as we wanted to. I'd love to do that. I also think, and perhaps maybe as a result of, of being able to interact with all of you, I would love to do uh, a few projects that are, are focused on looking at this from multiple perspectives. So we have the advantage of being able to look at this comparatively across the, the world and, and to apply this kind of objective sense from outside. But I'd love to kind of work with academics and scholars within the region much more closely on the design and, and assessment of what all this means and we might end up looking at different things um, and so that would be interesting um, going back to some of the other questions um, Philip's question was an interesting one on leveraging the new Silk Road uh, concept um, and and whether uh, the Chinese Ministry of Foreign Affairs still recognizes the importance of Central Asia I mean I think absolutely I think uh, China well, I can't speak for Beijing, but in terms of their revealed priorities, <laughs> which, I, which I look at historically over time and space, I would say that Central Asia is quite prominent um, in, in Beijing's mind. Um, and I think that's true across the tools that, you know, the, the relationships are somewhat different, which countries get what is somewhat different, but um, it's clear that China views uh, Central Asia as particularly critical to land corridors to be able to uh, connect access to energy resources, connect to markets uh, in Europe. Um, that doesn't happen without Central Asia. One of the, the reasons I think that um, you know, China has been so successful uh, in the region is, is it's really, you know, emphasized connectivity that's of interest to many of the Central Asian governments. Uh, I did uh, key informant interviews with hundreds of leaders across Central and South Asia in a prior version of this study. And often when people pointed to examples of China's influence and effectiveness, it was around getting agreements across countries that had to sign up to a common connectivity project, you know, whether it's a road or a railway or a pipeline. These things require multiple jurisdictions across international borders that would not, that the people that I interviewed said would not have happened without China's engagement. And so that's not easy to do. It takes money. It takes investment of time and effort <laughs> and, and continuity. And so in my mind, I think China is 
doubling down on that. And I also think that the emphasis on these social ties, you know, I think is, is pretty critical as well. I think, Neva, you've written on the Luban workshops, which I think are fascinating as a tool. I think they're the next Confucius <laughs> Institutes, if you will. Um, you know, I think that this, this pairing of higher education, uh, Chinese universities with Chinese firms, with host partners uh, in countries, it's a really interesting example of China sidestepping a, a common criticism of its policies of being of exporting uh, Chinese labor and not using local labor. They've been able to sidestep that with these Luban workshops, kind of training local local uh, workforces, but doing it in a way that is not at their their expense of their own interests. You know, being able to lock in uh, these longer term relationships. So I guess my my take is. I think that they they have embraced the con concept. I think they continue to embrace the concept. Whether they're doing better than um, who, who did you ask uh, the European Union? Uh, well, I would have to do a follow on study that looks at the European Union uh, versus China. But you know, I think. Uh, the fact that Italy has now joined the BRI is striking uh, to me, and I think that you know you have. Uh, more interest in join, joining the BRI as kind of a common um, a common umbrella for for partnership and for connectivity. I think that's interesting. You know, I don't see a corollary uh, for for the the European Union. So I, I don't know if that answers your question. I think it's the jury's out. You know, let's let's see a head to head comparison for a truly objective look. But I think in terms of the narrative of connectivity and the narrative around the Silk Road, um, I think that, you know, BRI probably has has more track record for that. Um, I think that there is another question from Linda. It's an interesting one about the anniversary of the collapse of the Soviet Union. Yeah, I think. Um, in terms of how this might have shaped uh, China's diplomacy in the region, I think that China is certainly engaging in public diplomacy in Central Asia with a, a close eye on the reactions of Russia. I don't think it wants to do anything to provoke Russia. Um, at the same time, I think the fact, and then we wrote about this in the report, so I encourage you to check it out. One of the the interesting testing grounds in my mind is language policy. Uh, you know, as kind of an early um, barometer of potential shifts. So, language policy in Central Asia, what I found very interesting is to see kind of this as a as a place where governments are increasingly asserting their their independence from Russia's sphere of influence. That Russia is not going anywhere anywhere time soon, but you see examples within the region of, um, um, you know, dropping Cyrillic alphabet, you know, shifting to a Latinized script, uh, you know, incorporation of new and different foreign languages within curriculums that, you know, are being promoted by ministries of education. Um, and I think that, you know, that's partly a reaction in trying to assert independence from Russia, but it's also an opportunity for China to be able to step in and, and you know, provide access to Mandarin language teachers and trainers and curriculum and, and be ready, ready to go with that. Um, and so I think it is partly reacting to the opportunities of Russia ceding a little bit of ground, not being proactive in you know, sustaining these, these close ties. Um, I think that it's taking in, in the advantage of the fact that it has a lot more economic clout than Russia. And so that's seen as an attractive force. So, you know, if you have the combination of, of um, governments trying to, to uh, wean themselves off of Russian influence, kind of pushing away Russian language and culture, seeing China as economically attractive and then being open to learning new language and culture because of those opportunities, um, you know, that's, that's, you know, significant for, for China's ability to influence the region. I think it probably has learned from what Russia is doing. I mean, as I alluded to from the start, China is actually late in the game with language and cultural promotion. 
uh, you know, some of the earliest examples of, I think this is true for US, Russia, and India, and the UK, and there were examples of these centers popping up as early as the 1940s and 50s. For China, its first center in Central Asia opened up in 2004 in Tashkent. So it's fairly late. Um, it's had the opportunity to kind of learn from, uh, from its predecessors for sure. Um, yeah, so I, I think um, you know, it's safe to say it's learning from Russia. It's also observing Russia, but it's also taking advantage of, of opportunities when Russia is ceding ground. Um, and then I think the last thing I wanted to say that I didn't get to from the question before, there was a, a comment about the Gallup World Poll and the benefit of looking at other polls. And I would say that definitely is true um, in looking at other countries. So we've looked in the past at uh, some of the regional barometers in some of our past work. One of the challenges when you try to do that at scale is that not all of the regional barometers ask the same questions and they don't do so every year and it makes it difficult to compare, but it could be useful to, to cross-reference. I do love the idea of adding additional actors like Turkey. Uh, that would certainly be a relevant one. Um, but yeah, I, I think that's maybe all I would say on that. Did I get them all, Neva? <laughs> I think you're on mute. Even. Oh, you're on mute still. Thank you, Samantha, again. Okay. Okay, great. Um, thank you, Samantha, again, for working with us, OSC Academy, um, to co-host your launch of your report. Um, I think overall, the fact that um, this report focuses on people-to-people -people ties is extremely important because the OSC Academy here focuses on track to diplomacy um, and what China has been, um, the way that China has been engaging with this region is something that is of uh, high importance to us. So thank you for giving us this opportunity to actually discuss. Um, to our online audience, we will come back in 20 minutes. Um, we will have a coffee break now. And uh, after the coffee break, we will have an expert discussion with um, Timo and Anton who traveled from Moscow and Almaty, who are experts on China and Central Asia. And also we have online with us, Raphael, uh, who is the long-term watcher of China and Central Asia. So um, thank you again, Samantha. Um, I know it's very early, so if um, you cannot join us in the next session, um, please don't worry, uh, we will keep in touch. And uh, to our online audience, please come back in roughly 20 minutes. And to our offline audience, please, there is coffee outside. Also, we would like to have a group photo outside at the Academy's um, front door. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Hello, everyone. Um, I just, uh, online participants, can you just send a yes if you hear me in the chat? Okay. Yes. Okay, do you hear me? Everyone hear me, Raf? Do you hear me? Great. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming back to the online audience. 
Um, unfortunately, we um, downsized offline since uh, our first um, session. Um, I'm sure everyone was very eager to um, read the report, but now we have a post report presentation discussion. Um, we are very happy to have um, with us today experts locally. Before we start our discussion, um, I want to offer my own reflection of why um, this topic is very important for us at the OSC Academy. Uh, particularly, Samantha mentioned that um, education diplomacy that China conducts in Central Asia has increased since 2013. Particularly um, in Kyrgyzstan, 40 scholarships are given to Kyrgyz students per 100,000 um, young Kyrgyz uh, uh, students. And this is a, a very a large figure. Uh, we also work in education diplomacy as, as the OSC Academy. And uh, we can see that Chinese education diplomacy doesn't just stop there. Um, this, these people to people that ties have consequences in migration, um, human relations, trans, uh, trans, uh, transformations of uh, culture and uh, norms, uh, trans, <clears throat> trans, uh, transmitting political ideology and ideas that are moving forward this region. Um, so we're very happy again uh, in 2021 to be talking about China following our previous event that touches on China last month briefly. We have um, 30 online audience as of um, right now and we have about um, not so many, uh, six offline uh, compared to earlier we had about 30 offline. Um, it's getting late in Bishkek, it's dark, but we are keep going with our discussion. Um, let me first introduce our speakers for the discussion. We have with us from Moscow, um, Timur Amarov, who is a research consultant at the Carnegie Moscow Center, the Carnegie um, Center for um, Endowment for Democracy. Uh, Timur is a native of Uzbekistan. He has degrees in China studies and international relations from the Russian Presidential Academy of National Economy and Public Administration and the Moscow State Institute of International Relations, MGMO. He's also an alumnus of the Carnegie Tsinghua Center's Young Ambassadors and the Carnegie Endowment's Central Asian Futures Program. Uh, we're very happy to have Timur here with us today. Also, we have um, with us from Amati Anton Bugayenko. Um, Anton directs the Asian Studies Program at the Eurasian Association for International Studies. He holds degrees in international policy from Fudan University, uh, and is an alumnus of the Peking University's Dongfeng program. From 2016 to 2021, he was a chief expert at the Institute of World Economy and Policy, IWEB, under the Nasutan Nazimbaya Foundation in um, Astana slash uh, Nasutan today. We also have with us online, uh, very happy to see uh, Rafael Pantushi, um, who is um, a long-term expert um, and watcher of China and Central Asia. Uh, Rafael is a senior fellow um, at uh, RSIS in Singapore and a senior associate fellow at Royal United Services Institute, RUSI, in the United Kingdom. Um, he's an expert with over 10 years of experience studying Chinese affairs in Central Asia and has traveled widely throughout the region. Uh, his new book, uh, which we are very excited um, for, is called uh, Sino Stan, China's in uh, Advertent Empire Documents. Um, it, the book documents China's growing influence in Central Asia and is due to be published in April 2022 by Oxford University Press. Rafael, very happy uh, to see you and very excited about your book, like I said. Um, we have um, 
some questions that um, are planned for this discussion. Uh, mainly, they reflect um, the report that we read. Uh, we all read the report um, about one week, two weeks before today. Um, we will also have questions that are coming from the online audience. So audience uh, online, please send in your questions um, as we go, and we will incorporate them in our discussion. Um, the way um, that this will be structured um, for the first um, 15 minutes, I want to ask the discussants to first uh, give us a reflection, uh, five minutes each of what they uh, kind of their biggest uh, takeaway from the report and um, focusing specifically on the parts concerning Central Asia, um, what aspects in the report has been the most surprising to you, what messages from the report should uh, populations in Central Asia here keep in mind concerning China, um, and some other reflections that um, we will start with. If I can um, start with Raphael online, is that okay? By all means. Uh, it's a pleasure uh, to join you all. Um, I'll, I'll just launch off then, Neva, and thank you uh, for the invitation. And it's a huge shame that, you know, I can't be there with you in lovely, sunny Bishkek. And I'm envious that Timur and Anton have managed to uh, make the trip. Anyway, um, I, uh, uh, you know, I, I read this report and I think it's, it's a really fascinating um, uh, data collection uh, and cr number crunching, if you will, of uh, China's relationships to Central Asia. And, you know, most of the findings, if I'm honest, validated sort of thoughts I already had uh, about a lot of sort of China's relations with the region. But I think what's striking is in some ways putting the hard numbers on what we kind of know or feel instinctively has been happening for a long time already. Um, now I think one of the most striking things in some ways is uh, on the financial side, the sheer volume. <laughs> And by that, I mean the fact that really Pakistan dwarfs everything else. And I'm conscious that Neva, you gave us quite firm marching orders to focus on Central Asia rather than South Asia. But it's hard not to notice in this paper that the amount of money that is going towards Pakistan and specific regions of Pakistan just dwarfs what's going into Central Asia, with the exception of Kazakhstan, which has some very specific natural uh, resource uh, things that, you know, oil and gas that uh, China is very keen for. Um, and so that really reaffirms, I think, the reality of China's sort of economic relationships with Central Asia, which is basically it's a very transactional relationship. It's one that's fundamentally focused on Chinese uh, interests and appetites. Um, and the sort of aid component of it is really at best a sort of, you know, second or third run issue. And so the interest when you're looking at what China is doing and uh, where the money is really flowing, which is ultimately where the real interest lies, it's very clear that Kazakhstan steals the show in many ways. And that, I think, is a reflection of the really cold and transactional nature of ultimately the relationship that you see between China and Central Asia. Having said that, what's interesting then is, I think, the economic, the educational piece that we see coming through uh, the paper a lot. And this focus on uh, giving scholarships uh, to countries. And in some ways here, again, it's interesting to note that Kazakhstan has this sort of early burst of economic investment that comes in the first sort of chunk of years that the data looks at. But then this sort of peters off as time goes off. And then if we look at Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan, we can see that the numbers sort of gradually increase over time. And if you look at Turkmenistan, which is always a very difficult country in general to engage with, um, it's interesting to see even China, you know, which is responsible for a lot of the big economic activity in Turkmenistan, also struggles to sort of get its foot in the door in this place. And we can see the education piece there actually decreases over time. Now, it's, of course, possible that this is about information access and Turkmenistan is a very difficult place to really get information from. So, you know, it's possible stuff's happening that we're just not seeing reported. But certainly from visits there and from conversations, with others, it doesn't sound like there's a huge amount actually going on on the ground. But I think the education piece is important and interesting because I think what we can see in there is in some ways um, an interesting guide uh, into the kind of longer term impact that all of this is going to have. China's established a very transactional relationship now, but it's investing quite heavily in the sort of soft power and the educational relationship. And actually, if you dig into the educational relationship, it's not just at a kind of state to state level, though I'm conscious that a lot of the discussion in the papers about Confucius Institutes and, uh, and HSK levels, um, but actually it's a lot of companies are doing stuff as well. And I think that's what's really interesting. You really see 
a kind of a push from a Chinese perspective to build up this kind of cultural capital and this connection at a people to people level, which while at the moment is clearly not having the effect that's desired, because if we look at the, uh, you know, the attractiveness rates of Russia or the United States or India, in fact, in comparison to China, in a lot of these regions, it's, you know, China is still, you know, very low down on the list. Um, but I think the longer term impact of that is going to be, I think, an interesting thing to observe as we see these generations growing up and moving into kind of positions of influence. Um, the only final brief point I'd add that uh, on a kind of data point that slightly surprised me, I must say, um, and it could just be a reflection of the kind of time period that we see within the date that's covered in the data, is the positive perspectives from Tajikistan <laughs> towards China. Um, and I think it was Tajikistan and Pakistan are the two countries that are registered as having a very positive goal. So, you know, I've been to both these countries and Pakistan, no big surprise there. There is a sort of, you know, the, the, the narrative of China-Pakistan relationships is a wonderful, you know, grandiloquent rhetoric to it. But it was interesting to see it in Tajikistan as well, because in my previous, most recent visits there, I was actually struck by how much I found more anger and animosity on the ground towards China than I had seen previous. And I, there was just a sort of a dissonant element in the data that kind of stood out to me, which uh, I'd love to hear um, others' thoughts about. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll stop there, Neva, conscious that you want to keep us on a tight leash and at five minutes. So I'll hand it over uh, back to you to steer us further in this conversation. Thank you. Um, now I'd like to have um, Timon to have your five minutes reflection. Thank you. Thank you very much. I uh, want to also echo what uh, Rafael was talking about, that um, many of the things that uh, this report is uh, talking about um, and uh, the data that, collect, that was collected by um, the eight data, uh, many of this information supports the ideas that were in the air uh, for years now, and um, it is really important to have this kind of um, reports and, um, you know, um, analysis uh, to, uh, for, for us, uh, because um, Central Asia is... Uh, um, uh, you know, many people do follow Central Asia and uh, number one obstacle that we all uh, face is that uh, the access to data and data itself sometimes um, uh, is non-existent and uh, it is really important to uh, base um, our um, analysis not on just our feelings or um, our biased, um, I mean everyone uh, is uh, at a certain level biased, um, but when we have this, um, you know, um, hard data, we can uh, be uh, more or less objective. Um, yeah, so this is number one um, thing that I want to thank A data for. Um, another um, um, important um, um, highlight uh, that I see um, is that um, there are really um, interesting takes um, in uh, this report that um, I haven't been uh, thinking about, like um, network ties. Um, of course, uh, during the uh, previous uh, session, we were discussing that uh, when you have this quantitative analysis, you put yourself in the limits of um, um, of, of this approach uh, because you have to have uh, something that you can um, measure um, in, in time and space. But um, it, it really shows um, how, um, uh, you know, uh, even uh, taking Twitter, which is not uh, very um, popular uh, in Central Asia. Even here, we can have um, connections um, and uh, we can uh, prove that uh, network between the political elites of, um, or, or diplomats or people who are uh, close to decision makers uh, exist. And um, if we, uh, you know, try to somehow replicate this kind of approach to other social media um, and other uh, platforms, um, this can uh, open 
um, you know, new uh, spaces that were not uh, investigated um, earlier. Uh, so um, this is um, what I uh, uh, really liked about um, this uh, report. Um, and um, another important uh, thing is that uh, this is not the first one that ADID has done. Um, and um, I really like that uh, these, uh, you know, policy reports um, and the topic is, um, um, you know, it, it's continuing to be um, analyzed and we have data not only for the last, like, I don't know, five or, or uh, 10 years, uh, but um, uh, for a long term period and uh, the more uh, time um, uh, we have, you know, we have um, um, data about uh, the better um, analysis can be based on um, on that and better we can understand what to expect next. Um, yeah, um, other than that, um, I am echoing what Rafaela has already said and yeah, looking forward for the questions. Thanks, um, Anton. Um, yes, uh, actually, I already started some of my comments uh, last session. Uh, thank you, Samantha, you're still with us. Uh, I worried you, so you left uh, us after the first session, that's why I started before. <laughs> so, but I'm, uh, so uh, you're still here with us and I provide just a few more comments adding to my previous one. <laughs> so uh, the first things, uh, yeah, about FDI, why I really want to mention this. Uh, because I, uh, I actually got uh, the paper, the, the newest one, uh, only yesterday. So I didn't have a lot of time to, to watch uh, the old of paper. I just went through, uh, concentrated on the Kazakhstan, 67 mentions of Kazakhstan. I was, uh, all read it and uh, found it. So about the another your uh, report from 2017 um, about FDI that was uh, that's actually very interesting I uh, used this few years ago for my collection of data but here I want to a few, a few comments why it's important to uh, how we uh, collection this uh, this FDA um, if we uh, if we use in very official way um, I mean that, uh, like a uh, official FDA statistics of Kazakhstan. Uh, we see now we have uh, some uh, actually uh, outflow of investments. Uh, and it's uh, and uh, but the, the main problem is not only outflow of investments. It's actually um, uh, it's, it's actually some problems uh, with uh, calculating how to calculate because uh, a lot of investments usually don't include in like FDA. It's a lot of companies officially uh, are Kazakhstanians. For example, one of the most important, Aktobia Munai Gas. Uh, it's uh, one of the most important companies, but as I uh, saw, uh, I think it's uh, not included in FDA. Uh, it's why actually in your paper, I found this uh, the, uh, the most, if region, uh, Chinese FDA region in Kazakhstan is a Tarao district, but uh, actually in real uh, economy, the most important place is uh, Aktobe district for oil industry. So that's why some differences, just because we, we just change the methods of calculation and we have another result. So, um, and uh, yeah, and uh, about, I also uh, very looking on not only of FDA statistics, but also of IIP, International Investment Position. It's uh, uh, these statistics uh, show us how the uh, the Chinese influence in our community uh, growing on. Uh, is it uh, now is better or less? 
So it's uh, help us. I don't know actually about another state. I tried to find uh, Uzbekistan statistic. It's very hard actually, even they have uh, open website, but it's very hard to find statistics. So it's also uh, very hard to um, to look uh, the same uh, kind of statistics with a different state. This is a problem. Uh, but uh, if we concentrate on Kazakhstan, so I found this, if we uh, look on FDA, uh, statistic. Actually, we have not outflow, but inflow of investments. But uh, if we see an IIP, we have outflow. This is uh, this is show us uh, Kazakhstan economy now. It's not so uh, so uh, good for for reinvestment of the money. And Chinese company actually taking the money from from uh, Kazakhstan. What they got from the from the, what the Kazakhstan uh, economy and uh, send it back to to China. So this <laughs> it's a, uh, it's actually a big uh, problem for Kazakhstan at the moment. Uh, so it's uh, small things about FDA. Um, uh, a bit more about pools. Um, uh, I uh, want to say about some one closed pool that was two years ago. I can't say about the real numbers, but I can say about how, what the state was. So um, there, uh, we uh, made this pool with including as like a multipolarity position is uh, Kazakhstanians supporting multipolarity, uh, multipolarity uh, or orientated only on for Russia for. Uh, China or for Turkey. Uh, so uh, we found uh, the number one, it's of course multipolarity position. So uh, the main of the people still, uh, most of the people still uh, would like to, to be in like this Nazarbayev model multipolarity. So um, number two, of course, Russia. So uh, it's what I found difference in the your pools and actually Niva uh, Central Asia monitor pools, uh, some uh, very different, uh, different uh, uh, public opinions. Uh, so Russia it uh, was number number two and actually number one. So the uh, uh, and Turkey now became its number three or number two, uh, higher. Uh, we think it's uh, because of uh, the Islamization the country, uh, because Turkey it means Islamic. Uh, so and uh, it's why also we see uh, slowing down Chinese position and growing up uh, for uh, for uh, Turkey position. So it's and uh, it's not doesn't mean this Turkey and China in the positions, but it means us. So uh, the people. Uh, Okay, I'll say this later through the session about the population opinion. Uh, so, um, yes, it's about the pools. Uh, yeah, ah, and also about the pools, uh, you, uh, as I see in the new modern pools, we have uh, only for the recent five, uh, five years. Uh, I think we, uh, actually, uh, if we see more than uh, around 20 years, uh, because I'm believing uh, the, the last pool, I believe it's only 2016. Uh, the, 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 the rest of the pools, uh, I'm a bit, uh, I, I, I don't know, is good or not. So uh, we see the actually waves. Of the, uh, the of the uh, so what uh, like China so uh, or dislike China uh, the waves is uh, the like uh, around one, uh, 40 percent of the populations usually uh, disagree China and don't like so China is number one in the like hidden of the foreign powers but it's around 30 percent if it's not any information company it's under the 30 percent uh, if it's some information company it's up so up up to 30 percent and it's uh, usually it's changed every uh, one one this wave it's around 10 years so the last one actually was uh, after Xinjiang crisis and uh, it's actually maybe it will be changed something as we see in your pool American uh, Americans 
uh, supporters now growing up. It's, it's interesting because before uh, the China and the United States actually almost the same level of hating and liking. So yes, uh, and now we see something different, but I'm not sure is it uh, a long trend because um, it's uh, maybe it's only uh, about uh, because of information company. I mean, I mean, uh, Xinjiang problem. So I'm not sure about uh, is it long trend or not, but we'll say this about later on population part of, of the uh, our session. So I think it's uh, it, yes, because the, the rest of the comments I already said, Yes, so about education and uh, yes, the, the rest of the comments. Are, oh, I, I also want to mention about Twitter. Yes, actually, Twitter, it's helped to show us um, the, the official uh, ties with, uh, with, uh, with uh, official affiliated governments. But uh, it's also, uh, we, we, I saw through your report, it's uh, Kazakh's uh, Twitter and uh, Chinese uh, Twitter are really far away. It's also because uh, Kazakh Twitter usually looks uh, uh, oriented on Western media, that's why. Uh, uh, so if you are oriented on Chinese media, you using the Chinese uh, wave. So I think this Twitter part is actually a good start and we have to move on and find some other, other media bubbles. As I said, it's actually a lot of media bubbles. We have Facebook media bubbles. We have actually uh, official media bubbles too. And uh, so many of the people still, uh, uh, still believe in official media. Yeah, uh, official television. So, uh, and they, uh, it's also very interesting uh, uh, part to research on. And uh, from the source, like Twitter, Facebook, Kentucky, or television, we can find uh, the few bubbles in Kazakhstan public. And we see some difference between public opinions. So, but okay, I stop here. <laughs> I think we can um, debate all day about data and research method. But one thing that we know for sure is that Chinese influences are here. Um, so more research, the merrier to study um, these different aspects. I want to start um, asking a series of questions to our discussants. I will start by Rafael. Um, what are the specific concerns that China have in Central Asia? Um, and are these influences actually addressing them or not? So I think that, you know, China has, um, I would argue, one uh, principal concern uh, that runs through its relations with Central Asia, and that's really Xinjiang. Um, and that goes in lots of different directions. Um, it goes in the fundamental direction that uh, China recognizes that, you know, within Xinjiang, they have got what they perceive to be this problem of a minority population, which, you know, in Central Asian terms, actually bigger than most of the countries, but in Chinese terms is, you know, a, a drop on the ocean on the corner of the country. Um, and this community is in the midst of a clash at the moment with the majority Han, and this creates a tension within the region that they see has expressed itself as terrorist attacks within Xinjiang, but also around China. And this concern, you know, is important for Central Asia for a number of reasons, because in the first instance, there are strong historical links between uh, Xinjiang, uh, you know, I mean, look, the Uyghur population in Xinjiang is in many ways the sixth Central Asian population, you know, <laughs> the other five Central Asian populations got a country when, you know, the countries are being divided up and the world's being created back when, you know, Stalin and then later the PRC kind of defined what we now know as uh, the borders of this region. Um, but the Uyghurs didn't, they ended up in China. And so, but what this is also important to remember is that this means there are diaspora communities scattered across the region. So there are close links back and forth. And this has been a concern for China going back a long time. If you go back and look in 1994, when Li Peng uh, made his famous tour of the grand tour of the region, visited all of the Central Asian capitals, except for Dushanbe, which at the time, of course, was racked with a horrible civil war. You know, he brought up concerns about uh, Uyghurs and concerns about minorities and potential terrorists and dissidents at every stop. Um, and if you look through the 1990s, you see there were incidents taking place in China that they linked to groups across the border. Um, so this has always been a kind of concern. Now, what I think has changed over time is that I think as you've seen over time, China's security state within Xinjiang has become stronger, become more confident and got a greater sense of control. They've also strengthened their connections to 
all of the neighboring powers. I mean, I remember doing research trips around the region and going to every single capital and asking them what would happen if the Chinese were to request a, of you, uh, you know, some action about a dissident group, Uyghurs that they were worried about that was on your territory. And in every single capital, they said we would deal with it and they would give me an example of when they had. Um, and they were quite open about this. They said, these people are a problem for us too. We don't like them, deal with it, end of story. So they've strengthened that security connection, but the kind of security strength, you know, and the, the sort of strike hard campaigns as they describe them is only really part of the solution from a Chinese perspective. And this is where I think the second part of kind of the economic story comes into play. And from China's perspective, it's really about if you're going to, you know, transform Xinjiang from what they perceive at the moment to be a problem place to be a place of prosperity like the rest of China, it's going to have to be economically thriving. And that's about building economic connectivity into the region nearby to ultimately help the region become more prosperous um, and ultimately become more stable. You know, their, their assumption is a very kind of Marxist view of the world, which is, you know, if everyone has resources, has money, has houses, have jobs, they won't protest against the state. So, you know, let's make them prosperous. So that, I think, is the kind of underlying concern that I think underpins a lot of China's concerns. And ultimately, the concern from Beijing's perspective is that if they're perceived to be losing control of Xinjiang, this will start to really cut to, you know, the sense of why is the CCP in power? You know, why do, why, why is this government controlling the country when they're not able to exert control over what is a region that is a sixth of the country's landmass? Um, so I think that really is the kind of central animating concern when China looks at uh, Central Asia um, and its sort of relationship with them. It's really about Xinjiang. Um, I'll add as a sort of very brief uh, second one is I think what's fascinating in some ways about Central Asia and its relations with China in particular is I would argue that in some ways you can see them there testing out foreign policy approaches that you then see replicate in other places as well. Um, so I think if we look at the Shanghai Corporation Organization, this is a perfect example of that. Here you have a structure, the first multilateral security institution that China takes an active role in being involved in that isn't a kind of UN structure. Um, it starts in Central Asia. Um, and then you can see the model that they've applied there starts to pop up in other places as well. The whole concept of the Belt and Road, of course, was announced in, in, in Central Asia. Um, and in many ways, it was putting a sort of name on something that had been happening for a very long time. You know, again, we think of Silk Roads recently, we think of BRI, we think of 2013, you know, the great speech in, in Astana uh, of Nur Sultan and uh, of course Jakarta. But if you go back and look again at Li Peng's visit, he was talking about Silk Roads then as well. The narrative then was about Silk Roads from Central Asia, but at the time it was slightly different in the sense it was about bringing uh, economic, you know, the, the sort of hydrocarbon wealth from the region across China to again help Xinjiang develop and become more relevant, ultimately to bring it over to the coast, to get it over to Japan and Korea that were the kind of big, well, Japan, which is the big booming economy of the time. So these narratives are not new, but I think what's interesting is they always start in Central Asia. And you can see here them testing out strategies that then you start to see being applied in other contexts as well. So it's kind of an interesting test bed, if you will, uh, for Chinese foreign policy. Um, and I'll, I'll stop there, thank you. Um, thank you. Actually, I have a follow up question because you um, focus so much about Xinjiang being China's concern in Central Asia. Does it still ex exist? Is it still a threat? Um, because as we know, there's very strong management now um, on the entire territory of Xinjiang. You even called it a, a security state. So is this still China's concern in Central Asia? I think it is still a concern, yes. Um, and I think, you know, were you to talk to, I think, security officials across the region, I think you would find them worried, you know, this would be a kind of priority concern. I think we have to, of course, add to that the situation in Afghanistan, which I think has slightly changed uh, China's perceptions of security in the region. And I think the other element, which has probably been rising up over the past few years, um, is a sense of xenophobia <laughs> and a sense of anger towards China that expresses itself sometimes in violence towards their interests and towards um, their people. And that, you know, poses a complicated dilemma for China, because, of course, if this region starts to vociferously turn against them, how are they going to deal with that? You know, and they rely, they tend to rely on local governments, but I think as we've seen in some of the recent protests in, in Kazakhstan and even in Kyrgyzstan, you know, this caused an issue for the local government because the local government, you know, has its own local power brokers and issues that it has to balance with um, against China. So 
I think there's kind of the pictures become more complicated, but I think that from their perspective, Xinjiang and, and, and Uyghur distance does remain a kind of concern that continues to kind of bump up to the surface. You know, let's not forget that, you know, um, this is, you know, Central Asia um, is the one region of the world that has had a Chinese embassy attacked, targeted um, in a terrorist attack. You know, that hasn't happened to many Chinese embassies around the world. You know, and yet in 2016, we had a, a rather miss, uh, rather failed in many ways, uh, a suicide bombing attempt uh, right there in uh, Bishkek, right near where you guys are uh, sitting now. So, you know, this is a concern for them. Um, and I think it does remain. I think from their perspective, the heavy security state is kind of what's keeping things at bay at the moment. <laughs> and so I think their concern will be if you lift that up, who knows what will happen. That's true. Um, it is all about context. Um, and we are... I think giving very good context to understand Samantha's report. Um, speaking of context, um, I have a, a couple of questions for Timur. How does Beijing see their own influences in Central Asia? What areas are enough? What are not enough? And also, how does Russia actually view China's influence in Central Asia? Early on, um, we spoke a little bit about the legacy of the Soviet Union, but what about today? How does Russia view China's influences in Central Asia? Thank you, Niva. Um, in the first session, we were discussing that um, the, the, there is no strategy of China in Central Asia and uh, all, everything that China is doing in Central Asia is not uh, kind of uh, coordinated from Beijing and it's more chaotic than we think it is. And um, I agree with that. And uh, that is why I don't think that China puts uh, some limits uh, next to itself or uh, thinks about um, you know, limits from the outside that uh, doesn't allow China to do this or that. Um, so uh, mainly I'm saying that uh, China in the region is more reactive than proactive. And the only exception uh, for that will be security. I think many things that China is doing in uh, security space is actually proactive because in security you cannot do be reactive. Uh, if you if you're reactive in security, you're already failed. You have problems. Yeah, uh, so you should be uh, proactive. And here, actually, I totally agree with Raffaello because uh, even if uh, we think that Xinjiang um, right now is totally under control and uh, there is no even a little chance uh, for something unexpected for the, from Beijing point of view to happen. But uh, for Beijing, it is uh, still, uh, you know, the uh, policy that continues to be proactive. And for them, it's really important to, uh, I mean, I'm not saying that uh, this is good or bad. I'm just saying that for what is the thinking uh, in Beijing, uh, they think that uh, to uh, continue uh, keeping this region uh, secure, they have to continue what they're doing. Um, and that is why Xinjiang will be um, um, top priority for uh, them in the upcoming uh, years, and it, it will be influencing what is going on in Central Asia for sure. Um, if we talk about like other uh, spaces that China is uh, active in Central Asia. I also don't think that China is looking at Russia and thinking whether, um, you know, it uh, can or cannot go into, uh, you know, politics or uh, security because it will somehow um, undermine Russian influence here. Uh, I think number one factor that drives China in Central Asia is uh, whether uh, China has enough instruments um, uh, or enough uh, resources to uh, do something. And uh, if uh, even if uh, Russia is uh, on the table while uh, this taking decision to uh, do this or that. Um, this is not, you know, um, high uh, in the priority list, uh, in my view. Um, 
So um, that is why we see that China is not only economic partner for uh, the region. Uh, China is much more than that. And uh, the uh, report that uh, is published today by Data is uh, another evidence to that, that China is not going to stick with uh, only economic uh, partner, economic cooperation label. Um, China will be uh, continuing to grow its influence in all of the, uh, you know, all of the areas uh, which are important for uh, securing its own interest, um, and uh, it will go even to some, some very sensitive areas like security. And we've seen what's going on with Tajikistan, and it's actually uh, interesting that um, Tajikistan is the most pro-Chinese uh, country in the region, and this uh, is an evidence of why uh, China has um, already two paramilitary uh, bases in that country. Uh, talking about Russia, I think that Russia, um, when, you, when you talk about what, what's uh, Russia's thinking about China in Central Asia, you should understand how decisions are made uh, in uh, Moscow, in the Kremlin. Um, and here, uh, one should understand that um, uh, everything that uh, China is doing in its foreign policy is driven by, uh, by risks, not by opportunities. Uh, so uh, if um, there is an opportunity for Russia to grow its influence in Central Asia, um, uh, there is a little chance that Russia will take um, further step or additional uh, will, will, will spend additional you know resources to uh, uh, use this opportunity. But if there is a risk that Russia's influence will be undermined by any other state, uh, Russia will act. Um, as we've seen uh, right now, uh, Russia has intensified its uh, cultural ties with Central Asia. Russia is opening uh, schools in Uzbekistan and Tajikistan that are uh, based on Russian program. Uh, Russia's uh, you know universities opening branches in uh, Tashkent. Um, Russia is actively uh, you know trying to attract. Uh, uh, Central Asia to be more dynamic in uh, its uh, projects like uh, Eurasian Economic Union, like CSTO and stuff like that. Uh, Russia uses Afghanistan um, as a tool to uh, regain its reputation as a, um, you know, the only uh, security guarantor uh, in the region. Uh, so uh, uh, Russia is concerned about uh, it's uh, being seen as a less dynamic actor in Central Asia compared to China. Um, I, I do think that Russia uh, thinks about it and uh, trying to use, um, you know, because uh, uh, Russia has a lot of opportunity to grow its influence here. Um, and Russia tries to, to, to use that uh, right now since, since it's not, uh, you know, too late uh, from the Moscow point of view. Uh, but um, at the same time, I don't see uh, fear in Moscow that one day uh, China will totally repla replace Russia because there are certain areas where Russia is irreplaceable. Um, I'm talking about security because um, I mean, Russia's footprint in this area here uh, is really uh, massive. Um, I'm also talking about migrants because China doesn't need any migrants, especially from Central Asia. Uh, it, it's even difficult for Central Asians to get a tourist visa, but I mean, right now, everything is closed uh, even before that. Um, so, uh, uh, teal uh, migrants um, and uh, security questions are uh, very important for uh, Central Asian political regimes to be stable. Uh, Russia will be a uh, very important player in Central Asia and China couldn't uh, replace it. So that is why Russia doesn't see it um, as a uh, number one source of uh, concern. 
Thank you, Jamal. I think the question on Russia is very important because obviously Russia is um, the most foundational foreign actor in this region, um, and it has for many years in this region. But now, of course, we see that, um, and we have discussed that China is influencing in all aspects, and this includes security engagement, economic, uh, political, and social. And none of these things are possible without the involvement and the approval of Central Asian states elites. So, Anton, my question to you is um, how do Central Asian political elites feel about China's influences? These uh, tools that we talked about, these uh, different sectors of influence we talked about, did any of these political elites actually ask for them or are they strictly imposed by the PRC, if I'm being a little bit controversial? And then at the same time, how has the public populations in Central Asia actually responded uh, all reacted to that. We spoke about some poll data, um, but what is the kind of qualitative um, kind of nuances of these kind of reaction? Are there reactions from different uh, sectors of society? Are there uh, age differences, urban, rural differences? Um, what do you think? Okay. Thank you for your questions. Uh, so um, actually, may I just a few comments about the previous speakers talking about uh, the foreign, uh, I mean, China, Russia, uh, and uh, Xinjiang issue, because it's very important. <laughs> so, um, yeah, uh, I just want to say it's very, it's actually the best example, Mr. Pantucci said about Xinjiang, it's the best example to show us is China now don't have any old, like, strategy on Central Asia. So, uh, because uh, we, we see here, it's uh, uh, some uh, China want to solve uh, in, uh, some interior problems with terrorists, and they didn't mind anything about uh, how Central Asia public reaction. So it show us that they don't uh, coordinate the policy each other. It's uh, it's why it's uh, very difficult to say about strategies. But actually, they have a, a one great strategy called B B R I. So here, I want to say a few words about the, is China proactive or reactive? Actually, I agree. It finally uh, uh, it finally in, uh, with uh, Timur about China now playing a proactive role. But I I think its proactive role came from reactive uh, Chinese reaction reactive role before uh, and actually how BRS became. It was uh, an answer, it was a responding of uh, China on uh, Russian uh, politics in Central Asia. I mean Eurasian Economic Union. Uh, uh, China established Belt and Road uh, program after uh, Eurasian Union uh, started. So, um, and uh, and here we see it's China. China just reacted on the Russian policy when Russia tried to close the border, and actually the trade between China and Russia, uh, China and Central Asian states, uh, slowed down that time. So, uh, and um, this is. Uh, uh, kind of uh, Chinese reaction, but uh, after they started project, after uh, Xi Jinping found his ambitions here, uh, he, he he started to like to play more proactive role in such in such of these things. And now, yeah, China playing proactive role, and maybe Russia now reacting. And uh, but also uh, it's uh, also about back to. To, 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 to today's report about uh, this influence uh, and uh, uh, in the numbers we just saw Russia don't play a big attention on the on the Central Asia right uh, but uh, Timur already said that uh, Russia opened a lot of schools and I want to add that uh, maybe Russia actually don't need to uh, to pay uh, much for for Central Asia because the role uh, especially language especially Russian language actually have a strong positions here. And I also want to add, this is also about 
uh, some economy things. Uh, I think uh, in the modern in the modern world, why Russia don't don't need to uh, to be a fear to, to, to China's influence in Central Asia? It's uh, because uh, uh, Russia have a strong positions in economy. Uh, in what part of economy? In the uh, in the actually uh, in the service economy. Um, uh, uh, economists said, uh, many of world economists said now the, the world economy became like more for, for service. So service part of the economy is much bigger. So Russia here is number one, China is less. So China, and we'll see some two different roles. Uh, China will give us opportunities to make some gains. I mean, export some resources or make some productions here inside in the, in the, in the region. But uh, Russia will provide Russian companies, will provide services. And uh, so that's why I think Russia don't need to fear about, <laughs> about uh, China and Central Asia. Sorry, I just back to, to, to my real questions about population and, and the elites. So uh, it's, uh, I'll start with population. Um, I think uh, we have a, actually in Central Asia and especially in Kazakhstan, uh, as the country I focused on, uh, two types of the populations uh, on the, uh, the uh, like reaction on China. Uh, these two types is like who have a big knowledge about China, who have, who have a contact with China or with some information spheres against uh, or, or China's information sphere. Uh, and the people who don't uh, have any uh, good information and just reacted on the on the from this media bubbles. So um, and uh, I think the second one it's the biggest part is majority. Uh, the people uh, from the but the people from the second part we can uh, divide to uh, two two groups. Uh, the people who uh, it, more neutral and pro-Chinese, and people who more neutral and anti-Chinese. And um, I still don't have an answer which part is bigger. Uh, I just say this is majority part of population. And, uh, the, and this majority part separate in two groups. I don't know how, 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 how many people in the first on the second group. Um, the people who are more pro-Chinese, um, as I think they are uh, just a uh, kind of a uh, bit more educated. Sorry, maybe it's unfolded, but yeah, it's they a bit more educated and very pragmatic. And they looked on China as opportunity for growth. Uh, and they, but uh, they also not very fanatic. They're not uh, very ideological, some ideological think supporters. So I just say they some good, have some good uh, middle education. Uh, so that's good to let them understand the current situation and following own, uh, own interests. Uh, but uh, so they are more individual, individualistic. And, um, and uh, uh, let's move to the second group. The second group, they're more collectivistic. So it's why I think it's maybe a bit less educated. So they don't, uh, don't uh, very uh, mind about own interests, but they are reacting on the, what happened in the media. And in the media, we usually see not, not now and in the recent few years, uh, Xinjiang situation. So they are reacting, uh, they beat, uh, anti-Chinese, not very, not, uh, not very, uh, very anti-Chinese, but if something happened, they just think, uh, yes, China, it's not so good. So, uh, and, um, uh, 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 but this is just like majority what's usually uh, changes own opinion very quick. So this is, it's uh, actually the, the, uh, this majority, it's what uh, the, you know, like how to say journalists or information war specialists are working on. They're working on with this, uh, these groups, especially with that one, the third one group. So uh, let's back to the people who have react, who have uh, knowledge about China. Uh, what what this group I uh, I am talking about is oral months. Um, the people who back from uh, for native. Uh, 
people from Xinjiang to back uh, to, 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 to Kazakhstan or uh, Kyrgyzstan uh, or some other Central Asian states. We call them oral months. So they, already, they have a knowledge from China because they was Chinese citizens. Uh, another one, it's uh, workers in Chinese companies, also the traders and the actually activists. Uh, the last group, I say maybe they are not contact with China, but they uh, they in the, uh, the the information flow of the Chinese uh, of the situation uh, around China. So it's activists, uh, some activists pro, very pro Chinese, but the most of uh, it's very anti Chinese. So this is fanatics or or ideological supporters. They usually some many of them have a good education, the best Western education. And because of the like, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, they're very individual individualists, but they don't want to uh, they, uh, don't want to support on their own interests. They also think more about some uh, ideological things as human rights, uh, and uh, so um, and uh, this is how the people. Uh, the, Diverse on uh, the groups. So these all groups reacted very different. Uh, and um, wait, um, yeah, ab about uh, a bit about uh, Chinese workers, um, uh, workers in Chinese companies. Uh, there we have uh, found some uh, clash between their own interests and uh, something, uh, something they're uh, pro-Chinese or anti-Chinese. Uh, oh, I want to say a bit more about students. Uh, the students who studied in China, is it Chinese soft power or no? Um, many of the students, when they came back from China, working in this Chinese company. That's why I can say this, uh, the workers in Chinese companies, most of them is like the former Chinese students. But uh, in, in real life, I found the many of these uh, for former students back from China uh, still nationalists. And even when, then, uh, when they go to China, they were like very nationalist. And when they stay in China, they also like to, 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 to live with, uh, I mean, to, to, to have a good connections with uh, Dungans, Huizu, and uh, Uyghurs. So there's uh, like, like to connect with them. Uh, and uh, and uh, after they back, they still uh, uh, think about China as uh, some, some fear, some sense, uh, not, not already not strange because they have a knowledge about China, but they think, uh, think about China in very opposition way. Uh, I actually can't calculate how much of the former students uh, have some, some, some like nationalist views, but uh, we, we have su such of these problems. It's actually also the problem of Chinese bureaucracy, how they choose the students. Uh, they just given a lot of scholarship to everyone, just if you want, they give them to you. Of course, they have some, some uh, criteria, but the criteria is not very high. Uh, so it's why the, many of students can go, go to China and study there. So, uh, and actually many of students after, after China go to some other actually Western states. So it's also China now, it's a way to, to globalize of, uh, of, of Kazakh and Central Asian people. So that's some, some uh, uh, that's China, Chinese government didn't expect. <laughs> so uh, let's back to the oral months. I also few few sent about oral months. It's also very interesting things. They are not very, uh, 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 they also uh, partly like China, partly very dislike China. In which way? They usually work in these Chinese companies. So they, ha they have a gain from China and they work in, on, uh, work in with China and actually help for Chinese, uh, for Chinese influence in Central Asia because they're working for, for Chinese companies. But they, uh, uh, in ideological ways, uh, usually they are very nationalist. So it's very strange to, to, to choose this oral months to which group, anti-Chinese or pro-Chinese. So if we see some meetings, they have uh, of course, they have some uh, oral months, but usually these oral months um, uh, have problems in Xinjiang the, uh, with family members. Uh, 
It's uh, not majority, that is, uh, uh, but majority of oral months don't go to the meetings because they have a good, a good job in Chinese companies. They don't want to, uh, to, to make our, our own life uh, worse. So it's about how population reacting in China. Um, uh, let's quick to say about elites. So elites, um, just a few sentences. Uh, elites, uh, elites, elites um, now buying a model of uh, uh, actually what what the changes in China's policy in recent few years. Uh, now China, uh, I mean in general, not only for Central Asia but for all uh, for all uh, uh, developing countries, uh, China now trying to sell a new model, anti-Washington consensus model. It's actually uh, last year I was in, in Peking University I, and uh, I found from the Peking University scholars, they're actually trying to teach uh, me and uh, some other developing countries members uh, to uh, to make some uh, some this uh, the, some uh, economic growing without reforms. So that's what they want to provide, and our elites very like it. So we uh, we don't want to do the reforms, but we, we we want to have a good growth. So that's and now, and now China starting to sell in us this model, and we like to buy it. But it's also uh, difficult to say if China uh, will have uh, some gains from this because. Um, we can just uh, study for, about this model and do for, 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 for us, and we don't need any Chinese support on this, except, except one thing, technologies. Uh, technologies, yes, they are the uh, elites very like uh, security technologies, and also here we back to population opinion. Population opinion sometimes, uh, don't, uh, they're not anti-Chinese. But they are a bit afraid uh, if government start control them uh, more than before. Uh, so and uh, because of this problem, uh, because of this problem, uh, Chinese uh, uh, it's Central Asia public opinion worse because they have some problems with uh, uh, with, uh, with our bureaucracy, our elites. Uh, so uh, it's about about technologies. Is also I want to say it's uh, technology dominate in Ch uh, Chinese technology domination in Central Asia. It's not at all. It's not like only China dominate. China dominate only in and will dominate only in one thing, in hardware and hard technologies and some software who, uh, what's uh, usually using in hard technologies. But in software, China can't provide any good services. Uh, here we back to the Russian economy and how Russia can compete China in, uh, in the digital industry, for example. We, we see example as uh, in, in Kazakhstan, uh, Sberbank won the, uh, won the program to manage in our own EGOV, e e e uh, internet government. So, um, yeah, uh, one more thing I really want to say about elites, it's also about corruption. Actually, um, I, I don't think it's corruption is a problem, but the, uh, because actually uh, the Western companies usually also make some corruption deals with, uh, with uh, Central Asian elites. But the problem is uh, when Western companies do it, uh, some corruption deals, uh, they're making just a simple bribe. You just uh, give money for something. So uh, it's uh, maybe very, very, uh, sim I'm very sim simplified, but it's like this. So, uh, but ch what China do? China doing uh, some, uh, uh, developing some Guanxi system. What is Guanxi system? They uh, help, they, uh, they let uh, for our elites, uh, work and co-work with them and make some gains. So uh, it's uh, th th this uh, this method is uh, much more perspective because uh, uh, if you, you know, what Western companies do, they just uh, give some money like this or providing some services. But Chinese companies, uh, they uh, they making uh, own uh, like they let some part of elites include in Chinese cycle 
Yes, we didn't talk today about this, but uh, I think many of you already know this Chinese, uh, Chinese cycle. It's when Chinese investments using Chinese capital, using Chinese technologies, using Chinese workers. So now it's also pro-Chinese elites in Kazakhstan. So it's uh, some problems for us. Uh, the positive moment here, our elites now find a way to have some gains. It's, a, it's, and it's very good for stability. Our elites more stability so they can uh, they can be they, uh, they can uh, can just stay in stay in our states so uh, but uh, the negative moment is uh, china if china established own strategy now this actually not strategy system to let elites include in the cycle no they trying to uh, it's uh, just companies own private companies, for example, uh, or I don't say examples, sorry, um, but some Chinese companies uh, trying to uh, establish uh, the contacts with and systems, uh, Guanxi system with, uh, with uh, elites and with companies, with our companies. And um, uh, if China will have a strategy, uh, I mean, the government China, they will use this system for provide own interest. It's uh, kind of, yeah, it's uh, like a, the system to provide an of interest. Uh, so, uh, and also one minuses of this system, it's uh, also because it's not very market competition. Uh, it's a Chinese way of competition. When you let your friends uh, make some work and uh, take some gain, this is not, uh, it's not uh, market competition it's also uh, we have so um, i think it's yes uh, thank you, it's anton, already time yes for, uh, sorry, uh, sorry. thank you anton for um the very detailed context i think we have enough context uh we are already very overrun and i just want to um last uh one last question from the online audience uh matthew gray who is an expert in the development sector um he um recently was in Uzbekistan for 17 days access, uh, assessing China's soft power in Uzbekistan. And the reason why I picked this question as a last question is because after we have a lot of context, we have an excellent report about um, different aspects of soft power. What China is doing in Uzbekistan is the latest trend um, because after Uzbekistan has a change of leadership, the way that China has uh, acted in Uzbekistan is completely new. Um, so what Matthew has to say um, is that he left on Sunday, just this Sunday, and he has deducted that China has mostly given up on soft power efforts in Uzbekistan and actually failed in gaining a foothold after two decades of attempts. And this is even after the leadership change. For example, there is no media presence. There's no BRI visibility. There's no entertainment presence. Language numbers keep declining. Confucius are dead end. Public perception is nearly null. And Chinese influence counter efforts from US policy, Korea, Western embassies in Moscow, Turkey, even Japan are very powerful. Uh, this was my personal feeling as well when I was in Tashkent and Samarkand a couple of years ago. So the question, last question for all of our uh, uh, experts, Rafael, Timur, and Anton, what do you think about Uzbekistan? Um, because the case of Uzbekistan is very alarming. Um, can China's political economic efforts be sustainable if there is no soft power? Will soft power failure actually result in more hard power assertiveness? As we know, Uzbekistan and China does work quite extensively in the military sphere. Um, in the absence of soft power and engagement with the Uzbek public, how is this going to look like? Rafael, maybe we'll start with you first. Sure. Uh, thank you. I'll um, answer that. Uh, a very interesting question, but I do want to react to a couple of things that uh, Anton mentioned. Um, I uh, was uh, particularly struck, I think, by your point about soft power, I think, which is an interesting one to linger on because it's such a big part of this report. Um, because I think um, you do raise an interesting point. You know, uh, why do we instinctively think that people with a Chinese education are going to be pro-Chinese, right? 
um, that hasn't worked out in other contexts like that. We always think of Iran, right? The Iranian revolution was done by, you know, young men <laughs> for the most part and young women who'd mostly been educated in the United States, you know, who sort of were the ones who decided to overthrow the old regime because they saw it as an injustice. But I think, you know, so, so it's an interesting question to ask, but I think what's different here within this context is that I think the relationship that China's looking for isn't so much we want to win their hearts and minds. I think the relationship that China wants to win with them is we are your economic future <laughs> and we are your economic opportunity. And that is a different bind. That's a very different bind in relationship that means that it doesn't really matter if you love China, don't love China, it's where you're gonna make your money. And that's where you can see that the future lies. And that I think changes the dynamic entirely. So it doesn't really matter if these people go to China, come back home, a fierce nationalist, so, you know, like, oh, you know, Kazakhstan for Kazakhs and Kyrgyzstan for Kyrgyz, whatever, you know, they still know that if they want to make money, they got to go to China, you know, and that's where the economic opportunity lies. And so that will always override anything. And if that economic process is made easier because they can communicate in the local language, better. So I think that's why that bind works in a slightly different way. And I think it's a, it's a twist that's worth um, uh, lingering on a little bit. I think also we must also remember, I think the intelligence opportunities that are, you know, within having, you know, uh, large numbers of the educated elites, you know, trained during their formative years in China, you know, they develop relationships, personal relationships, they can be compromised in other ways, and certain, you know, relationships can be developed that then can play out in longer term. So I think that that sort of, I think is, is going to play out in a way that is going to be interesting to watch. And I don't think I'd be that agitated that you see these people coming back and still being quite fierce um, nationalists. Um, so that very brief digression. I think onto your point about Uzbekistan, I think that it's, you know, in a way it's tied to this in the sense that, you know, I think that the, the, the you know, what's different about Uzbekistan versus, for example, where you guys are in Kyrgyzstan. Um, in Uzbekistan, you've got a fairly strong state. You know, the state there is in control of its territory to a different degree than you see in other places. The media space is still quite controlled. I mean, I recognize it's opened up a little bit and they're letting in a certain amount of free press and so on, but it's still very tightly controlled in a way that I think is different to what you see in Kyrgyzstan and Kazakhstan. Now, why is that important? That's important because from a Chinese perspective then, why do you need to bother doing all the noise <laughs> and decoration around promoting BRI, shouting about how wonderful everything is, because ultimately the key people are really kind of willing to do deals with you. And I think there has been a noticeable change in the economic relationship since uh, President Karimov died. I mean, Karimov was a very paranoid man who kept his country completely sealed off, <laughs> you know, in many ways from the region. And while some of his family members, I think did quite well out of the relationship with China, an awful lot of other people got quite locked out of it. Now, that has changed. There is a growing, you know, middle and upper class who are making a lot of money in China and are developing their relationship. They don't need, frankly, to have the, you know, the, the masses, you know, sold on China. They will just kind of tell them this is, you know, what our relationship is and this is how it's going to proceed. So I think that there's a different dynamic that exists in Uzbekistan, which is why I don't think we should necessarily look to, you know, uh, what we see happening in Kyrgyzstan, what we see happening in, in, in Kazakhstan, or even necessarily in Tajikistan to get a sort of roadmap of what it's necessarily going to look like. I think you know, and on the point about Confucius Institutes, you know, I mean, um, I, I visited the two Confucius Institutes that exist in, in Tashkent many years ago, and I was struck at how underfunded they were, you know, uh, they were really poor secondary students to the local universities. I mean, Tashkent University had a very good Mandarin language school, and actually there were some Hanban teachers who were sent to the local university. So, you know, and this is where I met the very impressive young Uzbeks who spoke very better Mandarin than me, who were like correcting my Chinese, you know, you know, very smart people there. And this was happening at the local university. So in a way, there's not the same need for Confucius Institutes that you have in a country like Kyrgyzstan, where you've got, you know, you guys are sitting in a very good didactic institution in Bishkek right now. But unfortunately, you know, a lot of uh, Kyrgyz schools are not up to sort of sense. So they need more of the support. So I think that's why you just see this kind of imbalance. I'm not sure I would look at a metric like Confucius Institutes or their sort of popularity in a place like Uzbekistan as a metric of soft power there. Because I think if you were to go to the local universities, you'd find a lot of people, smart young people learning Mandarin with the local system, with teachers probably sent by Hanban as well. Um, you know, there. So I don't, you know, so I think it, it, it's playing out in a very similar way, but I think it's happening in a different dynamic to what we're maybe seeing playing out um, in the other countries. Um, so I'll, I'll maybe uh, leave it at that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ralph. Um, and Timor, who is uh, uh, actually from Uzbekistan.
Yes, I actually totally agree with uh, Raffaello and um, I think I don't have many things to add, but um, I would just um, echo, yeah, uh, it's not the people who um, taking decisions in Uzbekistan uh, for now and I and for the nearest future and that is why uh, China uh, does not need to be uh, you know, spending a lot of resources on soft power because uh, um, it's really difficult to make people love you, you know, uh, and soft power requires so much resources. Um, so uh, for China, it, it's not essential uh, for now to uh dive into uh becoming uh, really uh, you know good in the eyes of uzbeks um, uh, soft power but um uh, there is a uh, slight uh, i would say um but there are some efforts that china is uh, uh, proposing for example in uzbekistan there is a media called padropna uz who writes about uh china in a very strange uh, manner, you know, they cover um, all uh, Communist Party, uh, you know, meetings, and uh, there are many articles about Xi Jinping being the best man in the world and stuff like that. So um, uh, there are different uh, outlets that are pro-Chinese, that are. Uh, Chinese companies, there are, um, uh, you know, and Confucius Institute and uh, people are uh, becoming more and more interested in China. But um, um, I, I do agree that uh, Beijing doesn't see uh, uh, Uzbekistan um, as a uh, necessary uh, space for promoting its, um, you know, soft power uh, instrument. Uh, but um, uh, my take is that if uh, uh, reforms will uh, in Uzbekistan will continue and uh, society and uh, will be more and more active uh, in the future, we will see uh, something like. Um, what is going on in Kazakhstan with anti-Chinese uh, protests or in Kyrgyzstan, we will see uh, something like that in Uzbekistan as well, uh, because uh, on the governmental level, co cooperation with China is growing, uh, but um, on the level of society, uh, there is a skepticism towards uh, Chinese uh, projects uh, because people see what's in the news because people see what's in going on in other Central Asian countries and uh, there is actually a, um, a proof from a Central Asian barometer that shows that uh, people are becoming more and more skeptical in Uzbekistan towards um, the uh, Chinese funded uh, project um, um, and I uh, do believe that um, when uh, Uzbekistan will become a little bit more democratic, when we will see people actually going to the streets, not only because of uh, anti-Chinese sentiment or uh, stuff like that, but at all <laughs> protesting, uh, we will see uh, growth of um, you know pushback towards China, and only when this will happen, and only when uh, the government will uh, have problems uh, with its own uh, population, or only after that China will be thinking about um, investing more into soft power. But uh, before that, uh, it could take decades. It could, um, you know, uh, it's it's a very long term uh, prognosis from me. Thank you, Anton. Um, your last remark, thirty seconds. <laughs> Please, I read it to the world. So, <laughs> I just want to say a few sentences about Uzbekistan policy. Actually, they doing quite well, um, providing investors, not, not the main investors, not from China. Yes, that's right. Uh, South Korea and Germany, and uh, it's much. Uh, 
it's very clever. I can say it's much better than some other states, but it's very clever to 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 use some some not great powerful states for investments. And also one thing, things. Um, for example, in Kazakhstan we have fifty six projects across of the old country, so it's good for development our provinces. But we also I just spoke about Guanxi system. Uh, Uzbekistan did is uh, it in, in a, another way. They put all almost all of the Chinese uh, cooperation projects to just to one zone. Uh, I forgot the, the zone name uh, in Uzbekistan. So. Uh, yes, Chisak. So in this free trade zone and. Uh, they like uh, focus on in this zone and uh, all what China is doing, they doing like here, just like in the, what, uh, in the closed area. So they control, can control them. It's interesting thing. I, I can't say it's, uh, the, it's better than Kazakhstan decision, but it's interesting different way, different ways how China is, uh, how Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan's government do, doing these deals with China. That's it. Thank you, and uh, thank you again for everyone that joined online and offline. Um, with that last remark on Uzbekistan, I just want to flag um, our audience, Matthew Gray, uh, who gave us very precious data from international organization agencies. He said that this year, there's been a 65% increase from Chinese companies to submit for international development projects in Uzbekistan as a contractor. but in this year alone, 92% of these Chinese tenders have been rejected by Uzbekistan. I think Uzbekistan is definitely a country to watch. Uh, there are so many foreign uh, uh, actors that are very active, like UAE, Korea, Turkey, France, so on and so on. And uh, we will see how Chinese power and uh, influence play out. Thank you again for everyone that joined. Thank you so much, Samantha, for staying up um, so staying up or waking up so early. And uh, again, for working with us at the OSC Academy, uh, we are uh, patiently and uh, eagerly waiting for the actual launch interview report and we will uh, share it with our partners uh, regionally and domestically. Uh, thank you again everyone. Thank you.